After studying climate change for a while now, I've discovered some things that I didn't know before. Some things that I didn't realize that science sometimes overlooks because they just think it's generally accepted knowledge. And there's some things in this video that you already know, but we don't think about them very much, so I'm going to go over them a little bit. So how thin is our atmosphere? You know, we always say things like, big as the sky, sky high, reach for the sky, the sky's the limit. But we don't often realize that the sky and the atmosphere are two different things. Because the atmosphere really does have a limit. The troposphere, that's the first layer of our atmosphere. It's about 6.2 miles high. That's not that very high. And that's the atmosphere that we live and breathe in. Actually, at the top of this layer, you need extra oxygen to survive, just like the mountain climbers of Mount Everest, which is close to the top of this layer. But think about that for a moment. A person can walk 6.2 miles in a couple of hours. 6.2 miles is across town. That's the extent of our breathable atmosphere. Not even that. If you could walk straight up, you would reach the top of our breathable atmosphere in a couple of hours. After that comes a layer called the stratosphere. Almost no clouds there. That's where jets fly to avoid air density. Then comes a layer called the mesosphere. The mesosphere is about 40 miles up and that's where most meteors and asteroids, or shooting stars as we sometimes call them, burn up. And finally, the thermosphere. Those last three layers have very thin content. In fact, the last layer of the atmosphere called the thermosphere is mostly what scientists called outer space. The line that marks outer space boundary is called the Karman line. And that's about 62 miles from the surface of the Earth. Now think about that for a moment. You can drive 62 miles in one hour. If you could drive straight up, if there's a road straight up, you'd be in outer space in an hour. The International Space Shuttle orbits the Earth at 220 miles from the surface. 220 miles! That's less than most people travel on vacation. Okay, so let's draw a close representation of our atmosphere to the size of our Earth and try to get the scale pretty close. Let's say this is our Earth. Now we do some math. This is a proportion problem. So we say that 62 miles, the outer space boundary, the Karman line, is to 4,000 miles, the radius of the Earth, as x inches is to 2.5 inches, the radius in our picture. Now we do some algebra. Multiply both sides by 2.5. The 2.5s cancel out. 62 times 2.5 divided by 4,000 equals 0 0.04 inches. 0 0.04 times 16 to get our dimensions in a sixteenth of an inch. And we get 0.6 sixteenths. Not even a sixteenth of an inch on our scale. Okay, so let's draw our atmosphere around our world. This is an imperfect image, yet relevant image of our Earth and its atmosphere. And it's pretty close to scale. Are you surprised? I was. Yet we did the math and this is how it works. Is the International Space Station that we talked about earlier that orbits the Earth at 220 miles out? Right here. And here's its orbit. Take another look at the space station. See the Earth? See the terrain? It's pretty close. It's really not that far away from the surface of the Earth. Amazing. So we've talked about a small number, 62, as in 62 miles to outer space. So the next thing I want to deal with is a big number, 50 billion. So I'm going to use some visuals and some of your imagination to get a sense of the bigness of the number 50 billion. You've probably seen a large stadium of 50,000 people or have at least seen it on TV. So that gives us something to work with. Here's a picture of Aloha Stadium. Lots and lots of people. 50,000 actually. So multiply this stadium with all its people by 1,000. Let's make 1,000 Aloha Stadiums. If we put 50 stadiums in a row and then make 20 rows, we get 1,000 stadiums. Imagine 1,000 stadiums full of 50,000 people each. That's a lot of people. 
50,000 times 1,000 is 50 million. Now let's take all that mass, that sea of people from all those 1,000 stadiums and put them into one super colossal multi-stadium place. But we're not at 50 billion yet. Now, let's multiply 1,000 of those super colossal multi-stadiums by 1,000 again. 1,000 of these super colossal stadiums times 50 million in each, and finally we get to our number 50 billion. There aren't even 50 billion people in the whole world, but I'll tell you what there are 50 billion of. 50 billion barrels of oil. The amount of oil we burn each year, plus the equivalent amount of natural gas, is over 50 billion barrels. Worldwide oil consumption is 34 billion barrels of oil per year. Worldwide natural gas consumption is equivalent to about 20 billion barrels. Those two together get us to the 50 billion mark. They actually get us over. Those numbers aren't perfect, but they're a good rough estimate and they are not an exaggeration. Consider this. If we took all the barrels of oil fossil fuel that are burned in one year and spread them out equally over the whole earth, wherever there is land, what would that look like? First, we'll figure out how many barrels of oil there would be in each square mile. Then based on that, we'll figure out how many square feet each barrel would occupy. Then we'll figure out the dimensions of the plot that that barrel occupies. What we're trying to find out is the size of the footprint of each barrel of oil. We'll start with three facts. One, we've calculated 50 billion barrels of oil used each year. Two, there are 57 million square miles of land on Earth. And three, there are 28 million square feet in a square mile. First, let's figure B in each square mile. In other words, barrels per square mile. So we divide 50 billion barrels by 57 million square miles of land. And that equals 877. So for every square mile, there would be 877 barrels. Second, how many square feet would one barrel occupy? Or how many square feet per barrel? There are 28 million square feet in a square mile. So divide 28 million by 877 barrels, and that equals 32,000 square feet of land. One barrel of fossil fuel would occupy 32,000 square feet of land if we spread one year's consumption out equally. So now we have an area of 32,000 square feet. So imagine that 32,000 square feet is a plot of land. Four average size suburban lots would fit into it. It's a little less than an acre. It would look like this. It's easy to find the length of the sides of a square box. We just take the square root of the area. The square root of 32,000 is equal to 180 feet. So let's pretend we have a square lot of 32,000 square feet with a barrel of oil in the middle of it. Now let's put four of these lots together. We can now see that the distance between barrels is 180 feet. 180 feet is about from my house to my neighbor's house across the street in my small suburban neighborhood. If we put barrels of oil 180 feet apart in an average suburban neighborhood, it might look something like this. This means that if we took all the barrels of fossil fuel that were burned in just one year and spread them out equal distance over the entire earth, crisscrossed over all the plains, all the mountains, all the valleys, all the deserts, all the forests, we would see a barrel of oil every 180 feet whether we traveled north, south, east, or west. 180 feet is the distance of nine white lines in the highway. And not just a single line along the road, but in every direction all over the world. And that's just one year. Every year this scenario repeats. Ever traveled in a plane and looked down at all the land on the earth? Just imagine all that land dotted with barrels of oil. It seems impossible that the whole world would be peppered with barrels of oil this way. But we did the math and that's how it worked out. Now think of that thin six mile limit of our atmosphere and that 62 mile line that designates outer space. See that bright blue line around the earth? That's a picture of our atmosphere. All that fossil fuel will get burned up and end up as CO2 in our atmosphere. And that happens every single year. How can that not have an effect on our atmosphere and our climate? It doesn't seem possible that we humans can consume that much oil, but it's true. The earth is a big place. Canada, United States, Central and South America, Africa, Europe, Russia, India, China, Australia, and barrels of oil 180 feet apart in every direction seems too weird to be true, but it is. 
Okay, now let's talk about carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is CO2. How does CO2, carbon dioxide, work in the atmosphere? And why do we call it a greenhouse gas? Here's an illustration of our Earth and its atmosphere. CO2 comes from a lot of sources, but the main source is fossil fuel burning. Oil, gas, coal. Volcanoes only emit a tiny portion of CO2. Mount Pinatubo, the second largest volcano of the 20th century, erupted in 1991. It would take more than two Mount Pinatubos erupting every day for a whole year to equal the amount of CO2 that we dump into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. The sun emits rays of white light that shine down on the earth and warm our planet. The white light rays also help plants grow and produce food through photosynthesis. But our earth also gives off a light. It emits rays of infrared light. These rays of infrared light mostly go out into space and relieve our planet of energy that was absorbed from the sun. We can't see infrared light, but here is a picture taken from a spacecraft with infrared photography, and it shows the Earth emitting infrared light. It's strange to think that our planet is actually shining, but that is actually what it is doing shining and sending its infrared warmth out into space. When white light from the sun encounters a CO2 molecule in our atmosphere, it goes right through the CO2 and doesn't affect it. However, when an infrared light from the Earth encounters a CO2 molecule, something different happens. The CO2 absorbs the infrared light, becomes excited, and then releases another infrared light out in a random direction. Sometimes the infrared light goes out into space and relieves the Earth of excess energy. But sometimes the infrared light gets sent back down to Earth. This can be a good thing that helps keep the planet warm. But too much of this will and does increase the temperature of our planet. To review, white light from the sun passes right through a CO2 molecule and does not affect it. But infrared light from the Earth does not. It gets absorbed by the CO2, becomes excited, and then sends out another ray of infrared light out in a random direction, sometimes back down to Earth. Of course, there are many CO2 molecules in the atmosphere. Sometimes when an infrared light encounters a CO2 molecule, it sends out another infrared light towards space. But if the ray encounters another CO2 molecule, it might then re-emit that light ray back down to Earth. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, as you can see, the greater are the chances of this happening. So that's why we call it a greenhouse gas. It acts like a greenhouse or a blanket that lets light in but doesn't let it out. Or in other words, lets warmth in but doesn't let it out. Okay, so I'm going to do a little demonstration here. Uh, I have a vise, a sledgehammer, a lighter, and an alcohol lamp. Sledgehammer in here. Get that nice and tight. I'm going to put my alcohol lamp here, and I'm going to put a little flame under here. Let the light out so you can see that. Okay, I just brought this sledgehammer in from outside. So it's kind of cold yet, and we're just going to wait for a while and come back to it. Okay, still kind of cold to touch, but not as cold as it was. Okay, it's getting a little bit warm to the touch. Okay, now it's actually getting a little warm. It's kind of almost hot now. Um, so what's changed? The alcohol lamp is still the same. I didn't turn up the heat, but yet the iron got warmer the longer it was on. So what was the difference between when I first started and energy was coming into the, the iron and now? Well, time. Time is the difference. But the reason I'm pointing this out is because we take it for granted. We, we know these things so much, it's intuitive, we forget. But Time is an element here. And what's happening right now is the energy from this alcohol lamp is going into the iron 
and the iron is collecting that energy, warming up, and it is actually shining now in infrared light. There's infrared light coming off of it. At a certain point, it will stabilize. The amount of energy going in and will equal the amount of energy going out. In conclusion, there's a lot of things we've discussed here. The four things that we have talked about are how thin the atmosphere is, how much fossil fuel we actually burn, the nature of CO2, how it acts like a one-way mirror, it lets light in but doesn't let warmth out, and lastly, the nature of heat and time. And I think the last one is the most important because we've dumped a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere already. And that CO2 is like that alcohol lamp, and the earth is like that hammerhead. And it's going to take time for the earth to heat up and equalize the energy that's coming in with the energy going out. Our planet is heating up right now and will continue to heat up until it finally balances. But the more CO2 we dump into the atmosphere, the worse it's going to get. We humans need an awful lot of energy just to survive. We cannot continue burning fossil fuels and dumping CO2 in the atmosphere. This is no small problem. We burn an enormous amount of energy. We need a new energy source. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you.